questions. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to speak here. And thank you all for coming on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I requested this day because I'm teaching two classes as it happens. So this is the only day I was able to come out. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this uh, uh, working on congestion in two different types of networks, packets and people, is kind of, the contrast is quite, uh, quite fun. Um, so let me start on this uh, data center transport mechanisms. I had a sort of more um, elaborate sort of introduction uh, to this area before now. And I, we have some interesting recent work which I try to make room for. Since uh, several of you here are familiar with data centers and cloud computing because I saw Amin's impressive talk at Stanford, um, I'm going to summarize just what I need for my talk, okay? And in fact, focus on the problems and opportunities that uh, we're hoping to address. So data centers and cloud computing are the convergence of many things. The convergence of networking and computing, the convergence of storage and networking. So many things are converging. And different kind of land technologies, Ethernet meets fiber channel, and so on, that, that are taking place, driving and shaping the industry. For me, and the rest of this talk, I'm actually going to focus on the convergence of transport mechanisms from above and below. Uh, layer 3 transport and Layer 2 transport. And the reason, you'll see that there is a very interesting um, uh, interplay because you can actually use either, you know, these mechanisms essentially interchangeably. That's, that's, that's the hope, that IEEE wants to do everything on its own at Layer 2, and uh, TCP already is there, has been there, and it can do many things at Layer 3. Now, the, the thing is that it, there are cracks between the two layers, and things can slip through. Uh, and there are deficiencies in each layer, and the union even doesn't cover it. You can't say I have both, and now I'm okay. A belt and suspenders kind of thing, it's not true. So now you have to figure out what the problems are, and then I'm going to show you some specific problems. So now our approach for addressing this challenge, I, I will argue, is that it's, it's important to decouple the process of conducting reliable delivery from the process of managing congestion. Okay? And, uh, and I will tell you in some detail what that is. But uh, in a way, <coughs> the two have been intertwined um, too strongly. For example, the you know, TCP congestion avoidance stuff that Jacobson did uh, went on top of the earlier reliable delivery thing that the windsurf Bob Kahn version of TCP was used. Uh, the sequence numbers and other things were used by him in his algorithm. It's, it's, it's such a, in such a way that it's actually difficult to separate them, separate the two things, okay? And you'll see that the layer two solution to reliable delivery is just totally radically different. It's nothing like the, t the layer three solution. And so uh, we're gonna look at two things that I've been doing. Uh, in one is to in this condition management part, another one is in this reliable delivery part. And I'm gonna argue that this is a solution for data centers in the sense that it uses the peculiarities of data centers okay, to give you a scalable solution. So this is an overview, and I'm happy to explore uh, some of the specifics of interest to you. Okay, so let's look at what layer three transport is, right? If the great thing about layer three transport, TCP, is that it makes no assumptions. You can go through an arbitrary network, uh, that is the round trip times can be whatever uh, in a six orders of you know, magnitude range, and similarly, link speeds can be in a six orders of magnitude range, and, and size of files can be in a nine orders of magnitude range. Nothing, nothing happens. ETCP works. Okay? Yes? It doesn't assume it. It provides it. TCP is what provides it to whoever is on top of it. But that service doesn't, it, it works on all of these scenarios, operating scenarios. TCP makes no assumptions about the operating scenarios. Right? That's what I mean by this. And this is the greatest achievement uh, in a way. This is you know, the scalability of TCPs in these kind of scenarios. And so how does it, in, in terms of getting incredible amount of uh, deployability in all these various scenarios of thin pipes, long distance, and fat pipes, short distances, and even fatter pipes, and so on, wireless, uh, it gets this incredible uh, uh, universal deployability basically by giving up on trying to optimize anything. 
right? So you start with zero assumptions, take everything to be the worst case. For example, the minimum retransmission uh, timeout uh, starts pretty high, <coughs> and gradually it's, it comes down as more and more packets are sent. So this is the great sort of plus, and then the, it's, not, it's perhaps too conservative for data centers. And the problems are that it has this per-flow state of sender and receiver, which I will talk more about, and that impedes hardwareization. So enough people have tried to build TCP offload engines that would do uh, TCP transport uh, in hardware, for example, in the NICs, and just have failed. In, uh, lots and lots of startups have tried and failed, and it just gets difficult to, to manage all the state on both the sender and the receiver side, corresponding to sequence numbers, window size variations on a per connection basis. And it needs to do this sort of separation uh, because of this incredible amount of heterogeneity that exists in its operating conditions. And it's difficult to combine them in any meaningful way because you have this amazing head of line blocking problem. I mean, this guy is never going to get more than 200 kilobits per second, and he will bottleneck this guy if you start any collapsing of anything. Okay. So that's one of the major problems. And the, problem, the other problem that TCP has is because it makes, it has the one size fits all kind of view, um, whether the flow is short or long, or whether it wants to go short distance or not, it does the same thing. So if you're a short flow going a short distance on a fat pipe, you're affected the worst. Okay? And the other uh, extreme you have this layer two approach, which is what the IEEE is going after. So there's a, there's a IEEE 802.1 uh, is the sort of big Ethernet standards body, and it has this thing called the Data Center Bridging Task Group, who have many projects, actually five of them, that are projects that allow you to allow uh, vendors to build Ethernet en enhancements to Ethernets. And here are two such projects uh, that are relevant for my talk, and one of them is this link level flow control. So you, you don't drop packets when buffers and switches get full, uh, a switch that's uh, about to overflow just pauses the guy upstream and says, don't send packets, okay? And so no drops. This is required for carrying storage traffic. Now, this doesn't take care of corruption, but we'll come to that later. So it sort of is the, t is the, is the layer two way of doing reliable delivery. Just don't drop anything, okay? And it... Uh, uh, in order to, now this has the problem of if you if you now let me show you how that works. Kashi, yeah. Just out of curiosity, what's the difference between this and the old hack of, of basically uh, sending a jam on the signal? Or is Nothing. It, okay. So, I mean, in terms of standards, there's there's a couple of things. So let me just animate this. So in terms of standards, there's a couple of differences. One is this: there is a standard called 802.3x, which paused the entire link. This one is link level flow control per priority, per each of the eight priorities. That's the only difference, okay? And there was enormous resistance. Even now, there's a lot of resistance to this. And I'll tell you why in a second, because it just throws the cost of these switches up in a bigger way than people want, okay? Um, so here is, so let me start the animation now. There's, there's just a couple of switches in a row, in, in series, and buffers are, are uh, are uh, here corresponding this output and that output. And when this guy exceeds this point here, which is the so-called pause absorption threshold, there's a, a transmission off message that goes here. And when the message goes here, and then sometime later the packets stop flowing in this direction, whatever's in flight, this guy has to absorb it. And that's what we, call, we mean by pause absorption buffers, okay? So packets are flying, and at some point the buffer gets full, so it pauses. And uh, you know, and now congestion spreading happens because this back pressure mechanism sort of propagates congestion backwards. Now, this is a well-known problem of bottle, you know, deadlocks and live locks and networks, and people, you know, are scared scared of this. So, part of the motivation for this congestion management scheme comes from this. If we want that, we have to have something that lets this guy directly signal that source to stop sending traffic in this direction. That way, he doesn't have to affect. You know, there's a tree of congestion that propagates backwards from him that can be prevented. And the other part of it is that uh, TCP is only one of the traffics that goes on data center. Uh, the dominant other thing that's expected to go is storage traffic. 
a fair amount of UDP goes on it. And so some congestion management scheme that is able to function at layer two is good uh, so that the data center can be autonomously run uh, with various different kinds of applications that people provide, okay? So everybody clear on the, so layer two, layer three parts? Okay. So let's look at this thing here. Uh, what are the consequences? By design, all of this is in layer two, just starts hardware. Everything is in hardware, uh, either in the NICs or in the switches. And so uh, it gets you the speeds that you want, and it's lightweight. it needs to be lightweight enough. Now, it, it does this partial offload of the CPU because in layer two, there are no, retrans you know, no packets are retransmitted, no acts to send, nothing. Right? So I don't need to act anything because reliable delivery is guaranteed by zero drops. The only thing I can't handle are corruption losses, which get pretty expensive uh, you know, uh, at 10 gig rates. So people use what are called short cables, 25 meter length, to keep the bit error rate small. Ethernet standards are written for cables that operate up to 100 meters. Um, but the encoding, and people do do things like uh, LDPC codes uh, on, on Ethernet, uh, in Ethernet Max. But the problem is that the encoding and decoding time for 1,000 bits is around close to half a microsecond. And so you blow one microsecond uh, in total for encoding and decoding at a switch, uh, the ingress and egress line cards, um, then you, uh, you, know, you can pipeline, of course, and that's, that's the cost per packet. Now, the, the switch latency itself is around 2.2 2 microseconds right now. Okay? So people don't want to throw that huge budget into the encoding for bitter rate. So they don't. So they, so they use short cables, and that's how they get around this. Okay? And so it has this problem. TCP doesn't have the problem. For, that's what I mean. It, if the packet's corrupted, the guy will just send it again. And pause absorption buffers are expensive. Why, if this pausing is such a great idea, why don't we do it in the internet? Well, the amount of headroom you need to leave here is proportional to the bandwidth delay product. I mean, whatever's in flight after you sent the pause signal has to be absorbed before the guy pauses transmission. And that's just the length of this line times thickness of that line. So that's where the cost is. So for Ethernet switches, pause absorption buffers on a line card are around uh, anywhere between 25 kilobits, kilobytes to around 35 kilobytes, okay? So aside from the, the buffering cost, uh, the two questions is the uh, idea that you uh, reflect this all the way back to the NIC and then to the application? No. All right, so you're just gonna drop on the ingress link if it- No, no, up. no, you don't drop anywhere. And, uh, so. This is gonna be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. No, no. It's it's a standard. It's 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 being it's being put into standard, right? And I I have talked about I've talked. You know, I, I found this an absurd thing, but there's a reason why they're okay doing it. And here's why, actually. Meaning, it's not that I'm okay with it, but what are, what are the what are the reasons that uh, people give? So uh, it's only per priority. The classes that contain TC, carry TCP, UDP, and so on will will drop. That's like regular old Ethernet. But the class that carries storage, fiber channel, will not drop. Fiber channel networks do not drop right now. Okay? And the way they do it is not by link level pause, but they do buffer to buffer credits. Right? So I issue a credit and then you transmit a packet. So I give you a landing slot before you. But this implies that you'll have to make this work end to end too. Uh, you just do it hop by hop, right? I mean, every, every switch. Sure, but, right. but it has to go back to the. Right, right. So if you don't have the if you don't have the second item, which is the end-to-end -end congestion control, so the way this is sort of and, and I'll show you, you know, there's there's enough simulations that we have done in the IEEE standardization process to see how these two interact. Okay, what you would like to see is that the guy who's causing congestion at the edge, because his link bandwidth suddenly gone or he's picked up speed or some new guy's joined, you want to hit that guy fast enough that this sort of pausing doesn't start hurting everybody else, okay? And you can do that in the networks, in the round-trip times under data center kind of, in the data center universe. And that's one of the things. And the other thing is that, so pause becomes more of a transient, uh, how to handle transient overloads. That's, that's, you know, what, what, that's one of the uses of pause. But for the fiber channel traffic class, well, if, if they need it, uh, fiber channel traffic class, for example, doesn't have any end-to-end condition, -end condition control. It runs purely on this hop-by-hop -hop back pressure through this buffer-to-buffer -buffer credits. So how come it's okay? Well, it turns out it's the peculiarities of SCSI. SCSI blocks are maximum size 128 kilobytes. 
If that's the case and the switch buffer is 150 kilobytes in total, you're okay. There's nothing to spread because a single file, single transaction will fit into this. But that's not true for anything like, you know, one meg files. We just overwhelm a buffer. So, so that's, I'll, I'll go through the differences between internet and ethernet because you, this is important actually. Okay. And, and why don't you get in a position where you end up having this, it seems like you have a tr class of traffic where this is not transient, that you are going to basically add delay for, for everything in that priority class. Correct. Correct. So stuff that wants to give you heartbeat kinds of stuff is a disaster. Right. So a lot of the control stuff doesn't go over this. It's actually, you know, uh, the fiber channel crowd is significant, right? And they have Ethernet interests also. And so there's, an, there's a reason why Brocade got fa bought Foundry, right, at the cost that it bought it. So, so this sort of big industry trends have taken place. Uh, part of the reason is that fiber channel guys don't want to keep having two different technologies when Ethernet's clearly winning. So there's an urge to converge. That actually causes a more interesting question, which is, what's the right way to carry storage? What's the right model? Right? Which is really an interesting sort of research question, which, because this is one way that people have done it, and now they're trying to force fit the solution, and all they want is this pause ability on one class. And so it's kind of, you see, you know, and now, how do you guarantee bandwidth for classes? There's other standards, which I didn't write down here. It's called QAT, which is transmission selection. You can coordinate the per class allocations, a little like RSVP style but by fiat, right? The, the net. So it's all sort of, Ethernet guys are just like, you know, putting things together and getting what they want done, and it's like, they're going in the same 18-month cycle like the computer networking, you know, computer industry is going, and the router guys are much slower, and so, you know, so they, they, they're, they're doing it, you know, in these ways. So, you see there's an interesting question here, an opportunity to rethink some of these, rethink transport. So, uh, revisit packet transport we want to do, and that's the focus of this talk, and I'm going to describe this QCN algorithm that we came up with for IEEE data center Ethernet. And it has some interesting features which I'm going to describe, including this averaging principle, um, which is uh, a, a new method for improving the stability of any control loop, not just congestion control loops. So QCN and Big TCP, you'll see, uh, if you're familiar with Big TCP, are allied, and I'll explain how. Okay? And so therefore, they both have this averaging that they're doing. And L2.5 is a shim layer that uh, we're introducing to provide reliable transport in data centers. Okay, and I'll talk about that. That is different from the pause method, because it just sounds like a bad idea, right? It's expensive. It's, it's not like the guys are doing this. They, you, they need a story to go forwards. That's basically, industry is kind of funny that way. It's like, fundamentally flawed is not necessarily an argument to not do something. Right, it's, it's okay, we'll, we'll come back to that later, you know. So it's, it's the kind of thing that need to, you know, because there has been very vehement opposition to this in the, in the IEEE, to this pause thing. And I'm almost sure in five years it'll not be a feature. I mean, it'll be disabled. So I wanna uh, show finally, and conclude by showing how they combine. So let me get into QCN. And since we're all familiar with packet transport like source side dynamics and switch or router side dynamics, I'm gonna, uh, you know, truncate and present sort of the main highlights. So <clears throat> I'm basically going to talk about this data center uh, standard uh, QCN, and it's in pretty close to the final draft. The vote's expected to be in July uh, in San Francisco. And it's for deployment in these kinds of si speed networks. Oh, <laughs> I didn't give you the pointer. OK. It's available on the IEEE website. I'm sorry I, I, I had it, and I think it's one of those things where I copied and pasted it, but it's a, you can just do 802.1.org and data center bridging task group, and you'll see everything. But the problem is that it's not well organized, so we're going to try and put this on our website. So a person who's not been to the IEEE meetings on a you know, six-weekly cycle for three years, like I have done, can easily just plug into what, this, what were the discussions like, okay? And... Condition control in the internet, as we all know. So it's, an, it's, it's worthwhile to sort of say, let's start with what we already know and see maybe whether it applies. And we know all this stuff. So, you know, uh, red exists in the routers for, as an example of a queue management scheme. And end systems have TCP. And there's a rich history of development of algorithm protocol analysis. A representative set of names, not exhaustive. So the question is, why look for another algorithm? I've given you some reasons that are more standard specific. But it seems 
One of the interesting things to say after working on this for two and a half years is that TCP's one-size-fits-all approach makes it very conservative. And I'll tell you what that means in a, in, in, as we go along. But in a control theoretic sense, it means it makes it unstable for high bandwidth delay product networks, which is well known. So lots of people have worked on high-speed TCP, for example, fast TCP, other schemes have been proposed. But I also mean it in the sense of flow completion times are not good. Uh, you drop a packet, then I'll take this sort of big timeout before I retransmit it. If, if there's only one packet flow, then I have to spend too much time before I retransmit it. So another reason is that Ethernet and Internet have very different operating condition, which I will go about, uh, go, uh, tell you in a bit more. But Qsyn is not without its uh, Internet predecessors. You'll see that it actually is like it's using this big TCP at the source, and it's something we found out <clears throat> I can tell you why we came up with QCN, and I can tell you why the big guys, because we spoke to them. It's very interesting, different ways of looking at the same problem, and there's some insight in, in both ways. And then there's the remnant PI controllers that people came up with at Caltech and at uh, UMass. That's what's used to the switch. <coughs> so what are the differences? <coughs> there are no per packet acts in the Ethernet. And so therefore, you can't know the round trip time. And you don't know, uh, so the switches must signal congestion directly back. Backward signaling is what's done. That's one of the reasons, because nobody at the edge can say anything back. So Nick doesn't ever send back anything. Currently, Nick's receiver packet, and there's no uh, corresponding uh, a receive packet doesn't cause a transmission of another packet at the Nick. Nick is only a conduit. It accepts packets, gives it to the host, and then takes stuff out of the host and sends it into the network. So that's one of the reasons why congestions go back from the switch. The other one is, of course, if you have pause, then the forward direction is stopped. So the, you, know, you want to be signaling backwards directly, right? because you hope the backwards path is open. And the most important thing is the algorithm is not self-clocked. And this, this caused us some fair amount of you know, anxiety on how to figure this. How, how do you know when to increase? Okay. So links can be paused, and therefore packets may not be dropped. So that's one way in which you could have got congestion signals is being taken away from you. And also, there's no sequence numbering of L2 packets. So I have no, this, is, this they objected to incredibly strenuously. Because L2 header space changing is very difficult, because all the parsers and the line cards of all the switches need to now mess around with this new header. So our, you know, talking about things like this or timestamp fields are just non-starters in IEEE. Now, the other thing is that sources don't wipe their feet before they enter the network, like slow start TCP style. This come in at 10 gig. So if a 1 meg file wants to go, a UDP source wants to blast out a 1 meg file, that's what it's going to do. And the Nick's going to just shoot it out at 10 gig. So before you know it, congestion is upon you because the arrival of a single flow. And Ethernet switches are much smaller buffers. I've already talked about this. Three orders of magnitude between them and Internet guys, uh, Internet counterparts. So most importantly, you have to have everything done in hardware. That's, that's an overriding concern. OK. So let's start with the QCN switch side, uh, what's called the congestion point, switch side dynamics. So this is one of the ways in which we don't hit the pause threshold. It's this thing here called, uh, there's a, the pause threshold is somewhere towards the top here. OK, so I don't, I don't want to fill up my buffer so far. And so I'm going to draw a watermark at the bottom end of the switch buffer. And let's call that the equilibrium Q size. I'm trying to maintain this there. This is exactly what the REM and PI controllers did. Okay? And so what do you do? I send a signal, which is the feedback. So depending on a congestion measure called FB, which I'm going to describe in a second, I'm going to send back a message with some probability, with increasing probability. So for the red algorithm, this would have been like buffer occupancy, and this is sampling probability. Okay? That's exactly what it is. So for the REM on, or PI algorithms, it's not just buffer occupancy. It's a function of the buffer occupancy plus a rate, OK, link speed. So in other words, it's measuring a combination of how much the buffer is occupied and how much the link is occupied, OK? And the question is, how do you measure rate offset? Rate offset is measured by number of packets. Uh, uh, so is the Q old? Q new minus Q old. So it's the rate of change of Q size is what's the Q now versus what's the, what was the Q the last time I sampled. Okay? That's it. 
And, and this is a good idea for various reasons, especially for stability. That's, that's the genesis of the Raman PI controllers, is that when the lags increase in the network or in any control system, you want to start signaling higher orders of the state, and this is one way you can do it. Okay, so you get this. Is everybody okay with this? Uh, I measure congestion by how much I'm in excess of the Q equilibrium and how much I'm in excess of the rate, which is the link's capacity, which is varying with time. And then I use, uh, I, co I compute a six-bit sum you know, summary of that and send it back. Okay? All right. Now, what does the source do when it gets one of these messages? Ignore all the details of the diagram. Let's just focus on this thing here. I'm transmitting at this value, which is called the current rate. Okay, so in TCP, this would be the current, you know, the window size. Then I got this message saying decrease, you know, I got this feedback signal which says, you know, I'm congested by this amount. So there's a factor of decrease. In TCP, the default value is a half. Here, it's some number between zero and a half. No, not zero and a half, half and a one. So my current rate can go down from where it was to 50% of where it was or to 70% of where it was, or 90% of where it was, okay? That's how many, how I can do it. And the gradations are 1 over 128. So there's 1 over 128 levels at which you can do this, okay? And so I can go from, uh, I get the message, I mean, I get the feedback signal, there's some gain that multiplies this, and that resets my current rate. So it's multiplying and decrease. Now what do I do after I decrease? Well, in TCP, I would, I would have decreased by, I decrease by this amount, whatever it is, and then I start increasing it linearly. That's what I would have done. Here what we do is, I stay at this level for some amount of time, and I'll tell you how much time. After the time has elapsed, I go back halfway to where I was. Okay? So I checkpoint where I was, so I was, I was my, the, the rate limiter was transmitting at this rate. Agree? And uh, when it got to here, and it got this message which dinged it while well, it got down and stayed there for the, some amount of time and then jumped back halfway to where it was, okay? And then a further amount of time later, it jumps back a further halfway to where it was, okay? So everybody is getting what I'm saying? So, yeah. Just a quick question just on the model just to make sure I'm clear on what's happening. This feedback is happening on a per flow basis? No, per buffer basis. Per source basis? No, per output queue. So it's just all the sources are aggregated into this. So this, this is one source for just convenience of explanation. But all the sources that are going through this link are going to share that output buffer. And whoever's packet gets trapped by the sampling mechanism. So depending on the congestion, I will sample the next packet that arrives with some probability, which is given here. And that gives me a source. I mean, I get a MAC address. And to that guy, I'm going to send this value of FB, the current value of FB, back. And then that guy applies this control to his current rate. Overall across all the flows that V or C is sending? Yes. But in layer two, a flow is equal to rate limiter. So the layer three flows that may all get multiplexed into the layer two flow are invisible to the layer two flow. So there's no notion of a flow. That's right. A flow is equal to simply one, a MAC address that you, basically the header, that's it. It's a layer two flow. So it may not be the ultimate source of traffic. That's the other funny thing here meaning you're signaling some guy. It may not be the ultimate source of traffic. So the ultimate source of traffic may still be going, at, like, blasting away. So, you know. High probability you would capture the that's right. Thing. That's right. No, that, that's true. What I mean is when you multiplex layer 3 flows into layer 2 flow, that guy may be doing, the layer 3 flow is not getting this message. It's not like the rate limit is turning it around, sending it back. But getting to the that's right. At which he's that's right. Going that's right. Stops that's right. So, but it's in this propagation sort of way. It, so, For example. But the other point that George made is correct and important, which is that the dominant source, the guy who's contributing most to the congestion, has a bigger chance of being trapped. Because when you sample a packet random, it's going to be proportional to your rate of transmission, right? So, was everybody clear on this sort of jumping back by this binary steps? This is the. So, our reason for doing this was it, it's very simple, actually. The, f the first thing you need to worry about when you design a congestion control or system or any control system is that is stable in zero delay, okay? The simplest way to think of a zero delay stability system is all the reasons that you may, you know, all the ways in which you can go up 
or the amount by which you go up should never be more than the amount by which you go down. Okay? That's it. That's called the Lyapunov condition. It's just an extreme summary. Okay? It's called drifting towards the origin. You can call it whatever you want. Okay? But that's it. Don't take more than you're denied. Look at the TCP scheme. Cut the window by a factor of two, only increase by one. For every integer value of the window size, that always works. Even when the window size is two, it two downwards is, goes down by one, and the maximum increase size is one. So it works, right? And at one, you don't cut it. So that's what guarantees the stability of TCP on the, in the zero delay case, OK? And that's all this is doing. This infinite series will never sum to anything more than whatever your old current rate was. So you're never going to get back whatever you were denied, OK? You're, gonna, you're, you're never going to take back, right? Yes. Right. So how do you decide the time between the two things? Uh, since I'm not getting any acts, I don't know when it is fine to increase. Okay. But the data center universe, uh, the 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 IEEE uh, standard assumes that the radius of the network or the diameter of the network is 500 microseconds as an upper bound. So if I send, and, and I know the minimum sampling probability of packets is 1%, OK? So, so if, if things are congested, then after sending 100 packets, I am likely to hear something back, OK? So if in 100 packets I haven't heard anything, I'm just going to you know, optimistically assume, quite correctly, quite often, that all is fine, and I'm just going to increase, OK? So this is the peculiarity of the data center universe that is allowing me to do this, right? Because I know that the round trip time is, is not large enough, first of all, and I know the sampling probability is at a minimum 1%. So I send 100 packets, and nobody said, you know, go back down further, so I'm going to go up now. Okay? Good point. So, so, so the way I, we use this time is there's a competition between will you send 100 packets faster than, right? Well, you send 100 packets faster than you know, the time it takes for you to hear back. Well, if your line was at 100, you were going at 10 gig, and you got dinged down, let's say, to 5 gig. Uh, to send 100 packets, it takes, um, at 10 gig, it takes 100 microseconds. It was 1,500 byte packets. So it'll take 20 microseconds. Okay? So each step is 20 microseconds. Sorry, 200 microseconds each step. Okay? Now, we're going to do five of these before we go back all the way and start probing for extra bandwidth, OK? So this entire portion is going to be less than the diameter of the network, OK? And the final microsecond is the worst case assumption. We had actually advocated to the standards guys initially saying, let's do 150 packets, it's safer. OK, but they were like, we're Ethernet folks, we just, you know, it's like little like Texas or something, you know, let's do it, OK? So, but also tests were sort of fine. I mean, they were bearing, bearing everything out. That is, even for 500 microseconds, this is fine, OK? So, uh, any other questions? I'm sort of condensing extremely, okay? So, this is a big pseudocode thing written out and everything. What would go wrong if the delays went up? Like, you know, the Good. So, if you go to a 40 gig or 100 gig or even to go to Metro Ethernet, so we have a, an appendix in the standard that explains how to scale. So, what will happen is that you will have to change. It loses that TCP self scalability the moment that it doesn't have that. That is, it doesn't universally deploy. So you have to go and set the parameters, right? That's important to understand. It's not like, you know, we did something massively interesting compared to TCP because we gave up something here, okay? So what would happen is that you have to make it as 150 packets, and so there, there is a relationship there. But big TCP do, is doing exactly the same thing, and if you gave me the axe, you can do this whole thing, okay? So this, this idea of sort of going back halfway is, is the basis of this averaging. Okay, which you'll see that it's actually a good thing, okay, from a more fundamental sense. Okay, so, okay, so I finished explaining it. What I'll do is, in the interest of time, I will not complete the entire description. I told you how the byte counter or the guy who's sending packets, uh, 100 packets and then jump up, is functioning. There's also a timer that helps us take care of transients, which is symmetrically defined, but I'm not going to get into it now. I'm happy to return to it. Okay, but I think I've given you the main idea. You get, a, you get a congestion signal that's a function of the amount of congestion, where congestion is defined as an offset, as how much of the buffer and how much of the link is occupied. And once you get that, you perform a multiplicative decrease and then do this so-called fast recovery, which is what we called it, uh, go back halfway and for five times, 
until you know you're within that distance of the current trade, and then start probing, which is just add a constant amount for every hundred packets you send. Okay, so so it's actually the increase is multiplicative, because if I add a constant amount to my rate every time I send hundred packets, the higher my rate is, the more I'm, more frequently I'm adding. So it it is a multiplicative increase. As, it's an exponential increase, as you see. Okay, but everybody get the basic idea of the scheme. So there's an enormous number of tests that we performed. I'm just going to show you the most basic one. This is the sort of thing we haven't done much in the internet because we have always assumed that link bandwidths are constant. But IEEE just starts by saying link bandwidths never are constant because there are priorities, and this priority is now. First it was going on 10 gig, and suddenly the other priority woke up, ate up most of the bandwidth because the scheduler that's working there with this QAT standard, and you only go have half a gig now. Will you quickly... Will all these 10 sources that are sending through this uh, congested link quickly bring their rates down, and then when the bandwidth becomes available, quickly grab the bandwidth, right? This is the so-called transients. And here's how it works. So the answer is yes. They will just immediately drop and pretty immediately pick up. And the recovery time is around 80 milliseconds. Our target was around 30 to 40, but we convinced them that that's just too aggressive uh, because the scheme will ha it's already running a little bit more open loop without any feedback messages or anything. So just <laughs> don't push it too much, OK? So uh, <laughs> OK, and you know, they listened. So now what happens is this, right? At this stage, sir, once you've got an algorithm, what do you do? Well, if you look at the literature, the next step is write down the differential equations that correspond to this algorithm, and then analyze them for the control theoretic stability. So you get these delay differential equations that you're probably familiar with. Red TCP is the classic one by Towsley et al. Vishal Mishra, Towsley, and these guys did it. Since then, it's been every algorithm has been put through those spaces. And you can write it down. Okay? And so for us, we had a lot of difficulty in writing the equations down. Okay? And I'll tell you in a nutshell why. We could not figure out how to fit this target. You know, There's something you remember. The big TCP algorithm, nobody's written the dif differential equations down because it's not easy, meaning how do, you, how, well, how do you account for this checkpoint, meaning how do you know, you know, how do you figure this guy into your equations? How does this work? Well, it took a while, surprisingly longer, so we just enhanced the state space. We said there are two variables at the source. It's not just the current, the window I'm sending out. It's the window size I had. It's not just the rate I'm sending out. It's the rate I, I was sending out. And as soon as you do that, this is, these are the two variables that you have for the source. This is the queue size which is a function of the rate at which everybody is sending, less, less the capacity. The feedback signal is a function of this Q size, which works out here. So you get this sort of couple differential equations where you have this delay stuck in. This is the delays of, in the feedback loop. This is pretty standard, except it's just like got more features in it because of this weird source behavior. Okay? Now you can write this down and then see if you've got the right equations. Okay? So equation writing is basically just you know, translating pseudocode into math, okay? it literally. And after you've done that, now you ask, how do I know I have the right equations? Well, that's what MATLAB is for. So you go to MATLAB and run it. And then you see if the pseudocode-based algorithm out of NS2 agrees with the differential equation solution in MATLAB. Okay? And the answer is yes, in the sense that there are two curves here. One is, it's difficult for you to read. Let me, this is called the fluid model, okay, the top, the blue line. The, this is called, this is the NS simulation. This reads as the NS simulation. Okay? So what I'm trying to do here is look at you know, varying round trip times for, uh, and varying number of sources. And I'm trying to see whether what I observe as solutions to the differential equations agree with the NS simulation. And the answer is yes, meaning you get the same heights and the same frequency of the spikes when things are getting, the round trip times are getting longer. And short round trip times, life looks good because everything looks stable. The queues are not wiggling. The rates are you know, not being lost. Here you begin to see instability creeping in because the, you know, the, the queues are sort of flopping on, on zero, so you're losing some rate. But the frequency for NS2 simulations and this, actually here, it's very visible, right? If this is a two millisecond round trip time, and you're losing a lot of rate, but it's, the fit is perfect, right? I mean, there's as much as you can hope for when you do math, right? So, okay? And then what do you do now, right? So I've told you, what, this, this is the next step. What do you do after this? I mean, it's a nightmare. You go back to these equations. Well, it's a nonlinear delay differential equation. I can't do anything. So what you need to do is linearize and analyze. So you linearize about an operating point and start analyzing it, 
phase margin, gain margin kind of stuff, and say how much delay can you tolerate, can your scheme tolerate, and then choose these gains, this GD business that I had here, that's the only really the, the gain you have, or this 100 packets, choose those kind of quantities such that you have your satisfactory amount of gain and phase margin, okay? Now, we said this is just like, and how do you know you're better than anybody after this, right? You just said, I have my gain margin and phase margin, TCP has his gain margin, well, now what? So, so what we decided was to say, well, we spent a lot of time trying to understand whether this something fundamentally nice because we, we observed that this guy was a lot more stable than TCP. Like, for example, the big algorithm, a lot more stable than straight TCP. And so now the question is, why is that true? Why is this kind of jumping back halfway business much better than an AIMD scheme? I could have had a multiple decrease and an additive increase is much worse in terms of stability. Why is that? Okay. So it took us about six to eight months. We ended up finding something more fundamentally interesting. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to jump to that. Okay, so I was going to summarize, blah, blah, but let me just jump to that. So the averaging principle uh, is what we, we found, and here's, here's the background to it. So when you have lags in your control loop, they become oscillatory unstable, as everybody knows. Um, feedback compensation is the technique, is the, is, the, is the methodology that control theory has, which says... How do you make a loop stable in the face of lags? There are really two main flavors. One is find out what the lags are and then apply the current correct gains. Okay, choose the right gains. So it's a lookup table thing. High speed TCP does exactly that. Okay? So given the current window size, which is actually a proxy for the lags in a in a way that you, you can realize if you think about it, and it chooses this lookup table, it chooses the gains. How much to increase by, how much to decrease by. And uh, XCP and RCP and fast TCP do precisely this, okay? For those of you who've seen those algorithms. Now, the other way is to say go to the control system and don't just feed back the state, feed back higher order derivatives of the state because there are more modes in your system. That's why it's going oscillatory. You need to control the more modes that your system has picked up because of lags. And just more modes means just higher order derivatives, okay? So just send it. Now, method one is not suitable because we don't know round-trip times in the Ethernet. Method two requires a change to switch implementation. That is, today I send you Q size, tomorrow you want the derivative. After that, you want the second derivative. It's like just, I have to keep changing my switch. It's not as easy. If things are in software, it would have been easier. This, this, this life, is, this, this world is just different, okay? So it turns out that the averaging principle is actually another method. And uh, I'll show you what it is in this slide here. Yes. Correct. And, and, and correct. But also you have to keep rewriting the standard. I mean, it's difficult to... A switch guy is going to sell a box saying, I'm, I'm compliant with the data center standard. Okay, unless the standard changes, he's not going to change. And if it's not going to change, you don't have an algorithm, basically. So in addition to the cost of the thing, a software change is easier even for the standard to embrace. Right? So here is just the investment, you know, it's just everything is in there already. So... Uh, the averaging principle works like this. So I'm a source, and I'm sending at a certain rate, and the network, like one in 100 packets, as an example, samples, and sends me back a congestion message. Or in general, I have any other, congestion, any other control loop, a sample data control loop, which samples the system at some periodic times and feeds me back the value of the state. For example, temperature in this room. is, is there something Somebody's controlling it. Temperature is being sampled in one of these thermometers, and then... The, the, the heating system is being made aware. Now, the guy just either, you know, if it's too cold, uh, it's, let's say it's too hot, it brings the temperature down. If it's too cold, it takes it up. So it goes, okay? And that's exactly what a control system does. Now, averaging on top of this means uh, I'm, se I'm sending at some rate, or this is my current temperature, let's say, or my rate. And then I, I was told to go down by the network. I just obeyed. Halfway through this interval, or between two signals, I voluntarily go back up halfway towards the old place I was at. So the current rate jumps back halfway towards the target rate. And then just stays there until the next network signal change tells it to go up in this case, stay there, and then go back halfway towards your target rate. That's it. Is everybody okay with this? Halfway during the interval, go back halfway to where you were. 
Okay, that's the that's the averaging. And you know that we've seen that QCN doesn't have any downward averaging because we don't do it. That, we only do it on the upward side because the network only signals downward changes. But other algorithms like RCP have an upward change also. Okay. So. Um, So now, uh, how does this work? Well, it works like this. So this is just remind you that QCN and BIC already do the averaging. And you can look at the RCP scheme, which if you don't know it, it's some rate control scheme. It just tells you exactly what rate to send out. This is by Duki Party and McEwen. So since I claim the averaging principle is universal, I must be able to apply to another scheme other than the one we have, right? So let's apply it to RCP. So here's what RCP does. OK, so this plain old RCP which when the round trip time is 60 milliseconds, uh, is this blue curve, that's plain old RCP, and the, and the uh, two other curves are the averaging principle applied to the RCP once, and averaging principle applied twice. Twice means in this interval, you know, at the one-third point, jump back halfway, and the two-third points jump back another halfway. That's what I mean by average twice. So, RCP goes unstable at 60 milliseconds or thereabouts because, look, the blue lines are starting wiggling and RCP, the, 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 the rate is lost and the Q size are flopping, but the averaging guy is fine, okay? And then what happens is that at 120 milliseconds, um, the averaging once is on the verge of going unstable, and for sure at 130 milliseconds it's gone unstable, whereas averaging twice is still okay. Okay, so you see that averaging is helping you. And averaging twice also goes bad at 240 milliseconds. Okay. Now the point is, I've enlarged the lifetime or the or the or the tolerance to delay of the basic RCP scheme, which went unstable here, by here a factor of two, and here a factor of four. Okay. So you see, just averaging without changing, I don't need to know round trip times, I don't need to change, I don't need higher order derivatives. It's all happening. Okay. So that's what's nice, and so this is a universal sort of thing that applies. Okay. Now, we can say, well, that's fine. Now, what's actually, why is the reason this is working? So here's the reason. A source that does the averaging principle and gets some feedback message, consider that guy on the one hand. Consider another source that does not do averaging, but gets a feedback message where the gain is actually dialed down. Plus, there's also a derivative component, derivative of state is sent back, okay? So this is the classical control sort of prescriptions. So I'm sending you more, and then I'm sending the gains or so have been dialed down. Okay, consider this precise constants and so on. If you look at these two guys, then algebraically they're equivalent. On the same inputs, they'll produce identically the same outputs. That's a theorem, okay, that we, we know. So the averaging guy is actually, you know, just automatically doing the right thing. Okay? And so to show you that that's true, why don't we just send back precisely not just FB, but actually precisely these things and just use regular RCP sources, and then the guy who does averaging, like I just showed you, and it's a pretty identical fit. Okay? So it's algebraically equivalent, and so here it's nonlinear a little bit, but it's still okay, it's working. Now you can say, well, how generic is this? Go to a generic control loop like this, some third order thing, it pulled out from 1940s textbook. Okay? And Bodhi, Nyquist, and all these guys used to do this stuff. Okay? And it's the same thing. So here's the actual uh, no averaging scheme with like no delay, which has sort of got some you know settling time, whereas the guys who does who does averaging it settles faster. There's less instability, there's less transients, and the guy with uh, doesn't do averaging but has this derivative and, and so on. The equivalent system is pretty identical. Actually, they're not the same. You can see the small differences, but it's almost invisible. Okay, so it's, it's nice to know the theorem actually is tight. So as you increase the delay, the original system got unstable. The other two guys continue to be stable and also to agree with each other. And after a while, the other guy is also getting unstable, but you can average twice and restore stability. So it's very straightforward, okay? So let me just conclude, uh, because I'm on the hour. I'm, I'm not going to talk to you about L2.5 because I just really don't have the time. So let me summarize the averaging principle. It's a simple method for making many control loops stable and more robust to increasing lags. And all this QCN and BIC and all these guys already have it. And it gives you uh, uh, there's variations of the basic principle that are all possible and so on. So the theory is fairly complete. And 
I'm going to skip this, but I want to go. I want to go to the last page for the conclusions for the talk because I do want to say a couple of things. Because I think data centers are keenly, you know, poised in the sense of really taking off on the one hand, but also being good motivation for research. Um, in private conversation or offline, I can tell you about the L2.5 method, and it's it gets rid of this pause business, right? It's sort of and, and, and the reason, why don't you just let TCP retransmit? Because the timer value is too high, okay? So it's like the default value for the RTO is one second, and as you send more and more, you can come down. And you can, so if you go to Facebook or someone like that, and we've spoken to them, and they start with a min RTO set to 120 milliseconds on their own. That's not the big now, right, for data centers, they do that. But 120 milliseconds is still a lot compared to 500 microseconds, right? If someone tells you that your universe is 500 microseconds long, why would you have a clock that waits longer than one or two milliseconds to retransmit? Because it doesn't make any sense, right? And moreover, you can terminate it at the, board, at the edge of your network. You know, there's a wide area component to your traffic. It's okay. The router on the L2 side will just terminate the, the retransmissions, right? You're only covering the, the, the internals, right? So this is sort of... Uh, an interesting approach, uh, and I don't have time to tell you about it. So I squeeze this in now because we ran some tests, and we actually have this built into. So my students' Mac and my Mac can talk to each other. Well, my student's laptop, we, he has it done for the Windows. My, lap, my Mac is, you know, dual booted. Um, you can, in the Windows Vista uh, operating system, below the IP driver and above the Ethernet driver, you have access to some filters, and that's where we did this L2.5. And so you can keep transmitting packets to that layer and abort after some three or four tries um, so that you don't congest the network. When, and, so, but, and to prevent congesting the network, you can sort of front-end with QCN, and it's fine. And so that's one of the things that you know, we're trying to pursue, and there's some good interest in this uh, combination. And so some of the shortcomings of TCP, meaning it's just TCP is wonderful because it assumes nothing. But if you have some assumptions that you can play with, then, you know, in your universe, then the, it's great that you're able to play with it. And um, we've seen how QCN gives you stabler loops, etc. So I was going to close also the loop on this uh, TCP offload engines that, you know, people are trying to build, but it's become difficult. It had been difficult for per flow state reasons. But as you can see, you know, you have a single layer two flow, which multiplexes many layer three flows. So it's a matter of a performance hit if you combine state in data centers. Is not a conceptual problem. It's like if you have switches that are input queued, as, as many of you m may know, you have these virtual output queues that divide up the packets that come at an input that are rest into each of the outputs. They're all queued separately. This avoids what's called the head of line blocking problem, which is known classic problem. It's really that. You, you can have separate state machines and get good performance, or you can have a single state machine and just take a performance hit. It's nothing more than that. And there's no correctness problem to the protocol or the algorithm, OK? And so that's sort of the major conclusion. And so, you know, on a sort of theoretical tangent, you can, because this averaging principle is kind of popped out of nowhere, right? Sort of neat to go play with it and, and see if it works for nonlinear control systems and so on. OK, thank you. Uh, BIC doesn't, BIC has some hacks in it, which we know how to get rid of. But in a more fundamental sense, BIC seems to have had it right, because it, it's the only scheme that, you know, you look to all the other candidates for high speed, you know, high bandwidth delay product networks. Uh, they all use some extra information. There's an extra work, like fast TCP, RCP, XC. They're all using some extra stuff requiring a different kind of network, like RCP wants totally different network. And uh, so in that sense, BIC just works because it can, you know, scale. So, but as you saw, this averaging has a certain span over which it can scale. Beyond that, it doesn't scale either. Right, so that's the, that's the answer. I mean, it's better because it gives you a factor of two or four improvement in, in the stability properties. 
but it's not going to solve it. But no matter what scheme you have, you can always do averaging. That's the realization. BIC is just doing something more fundamental like averaging. Right, so. Uh, this is for linear systems. Uh, no, but it doesn't mean no, RCP is pretty close to being linear. That's why I, it's not like it's not true for nonlinear systems, right? You know, how your theorem is with, for a hypothesis, and right now we just know it's true for linear. But there are some nonlinear systems like you know x dot equals minus x cubed. It works. Throw some lags. The problem with nonlinear is that, you know, it's like, it's like saying zoology is a theory of elephants and non-elephants, right? It's like everybody else. <laughs> so it's difficult okay. to... I guess I'm asking the opposite question of... Oh, no, I, I, know, no I, know what, I know what you're saying, but the thing is, the theorems there are of the... There's, there's something... We're just learning this stuff. There's something called the Popov criterion, and there's something called the two-circle criterion, and they're all sufficient conditions. It doesn't mean that if your original system doesn't satisfy them, but the average guy satisfies them, that it's stable. Because the original system may well have been stable, but didn't satisfy the sufficiency condition, right? So it's sort of, it's not a complete story. It's difficult to give up right now. Thank you.